talk about saints, I can think of a few saints in my life. My grandmother, for one, my granny Belle. She, uh, she just loved the Lord. I, I just know her. We would go to church in the morning on Sunday mornings, and she, she prayed. She started to pray, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed for everybody in town. And I would say, Granny, you don't stop that praying. We don't get church on time. <coughs> I just knew she loved the Lord. And my, my mama, she's still living, and she, she's a saint to me. She just loves the Lord. And uh, my mother-in-law passed away last year, suffered many, many years with Alzheimer's. I took care of her. And to me, she was just a saint. She didn't know who I was, but I knew she loved the Lord, and I talked about it with her. So we are so thankful for the saints that are passed on and the saints that are still here. Our Bible verse today is from Revelations 7 through 15. When the thousand years are over, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations in our four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, and to gather them from battle. In number, they are like the sand of the seashore. They marched across the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of God's people, the city he loves. But fire came down from heaven and devolved them. And the devil who devoured them was thrown into the lake of the burning sulfur. When the beast and the false prophet have been thrown, they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne, and him was seated on it. The earth and the heavens flee from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, sitting there before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is a book of life. The dead was judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and each person was judged accordingly to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown in the lake of fire. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Deacon. Several weeks ago, I was having lunch with uh, a family who has a name of someone listed in uh, our saints in the bulletin. And this person with whom I was having lunch said, you know, we don't hear a lot about heaven from the pulpit. We don't talk about it often, and there are so many questions I have not only about my loved one, but about what it means to believe in the afterlife and to believe in eternal life. What is it like to live with Jesus? We know what people say at the funerals, but what does the Bible really say? So I explained that in our tradition, for many, at least in Baptist churches, we really don't hear a lot about heaven. We may hear some things in Sunday school or perhaps some platitudes. And we may hear a little bit about saints now and then, but often, we don't hear enough. We don't have an opportunity to clarify what we mean when we say saints, because after all, we're not Catholic, and much of what we know about saints come from the Catholic tradition. And we don't hear enough about heaven, because I think when we get to those parts in the Bible that talk about heaven, we really don't understand what's going on. But for us who look and practice the Christian calendar, who acknowledge that there are special days throughout the year, we have All Saints Sunday, where we can clarify and define what we mean when we talk about the saints, what we believe when we talk about what it means to be, to live eternally with God through Jesus Christ. And we get to have that conversation. One of the most important things I think about All Saints Day is it acknowledges that lament is as much a part of our worship as is praise. That as we move into times of the holiday season, this Thanksgiving and this Christmas, there will be many families with an empty chair 
wondering what to do without a loved one, and it is good for us to encourage one another and to build one another up when the holidays strike, especially for those who might be facing a first holiday without a loved one. So I think All Saints is a good time for us to clarify. What do we mean when we talk about saints? What, is it, what does the Bible say about heaven? And for me, one of the things that I think about when I talk about heaven is usually the, when we talk about heaven, we get these certain mental images in our mind of what heaven may be like. There, there are a lot of things in our culture that try to shape what we think about heaven. And for me, I get to think about the Far Side comics. Any of you familiar with The Far Side? It's a little comic by Gary Larson that ran in the 80s and 90s, usually a little satirical comics. And some of the comics that Gary Larson has about heaven and hell are those things that really res resonate with me. I remember one comic gives us the usual picture that, uh, of what people think about when they think of heaven. There is a guy sitting on a cloud in his robes and his wings, and he had a harp. And a little bubble comes out of his head, and it says, wow, I should have brought a magazine for this. Because <laughs> there he is on the cloud in heaven. Uh, another one that I really like has two boxes. One box at the top has uh, saints coming in the, the gates of heaven, and there's Peter welcoming them. And it says, welcome to heaven, here's your harp. And then there's a second box underneath, and it shows people walking through, you know, in shabby clothes and through the, the flames of hell, and they're saved, and saying, says, welcome to hell, here's your accordion. <laughs> Pomona plays the accordion. <laughs> and I think one of my favorite cartoons, and I think I might have told you this before, because this is my favorite, has a, a guy, uh, well, actually, has Satan and a little minion there in hell, and there's the flames in the background, and there's a guy with a wheelbarrow just hopping along, Whistling a tune, and Satan leans over to the, his minion, and he says, you know, we just can't get through to that guy. <laughs> That's <laughs> one of my favorites. Just can't get through to that guy. We don't talk about saints enough, and we don't talk about heaven enough, and I wonder why. Because it is through the victorious life of eternal life. The promise of the resurrection where we draw our strength and our encouragement and our hope. As Paul says in, the fir in his first letter to the Thessalonians, we need to be informed about not only people who pass away, but how we might live so that we do not grieve as the world grieves, but have a hope set apart, a hope that is different, because we know that death does not have the final say, that Jesus is victorious, and that we will live victoriously with him in that day of resurrection. So in order... To clarify things, I want to go to the most clear book of the Bible that you can think of, and that is the book of Revelation. Of course, that's a joke. Nobody understands Revelation. There's nothing clear about it. But we need to start there because even though it is highly symbolic and there are metaphors and it's difficult to read, it is in essence a book of hope and consolation, a book that draws us to worship God and to join all of the saints saints who have passed on, and saints among us. Because it is through our worship that we engage in spiritual warfare, and it is through our worship that we acknowledge that the eternal life we live is when we start living as soon as we decide to, to follow Jesus Christ. Now many of you may say, oh, Revelation, I try to read that. It's scary. It's confusing. And I'm not sure why we're afraid of it. I, I think that in some ways that we're afraid to read Revelation or we find it hard to understand because I don't think we know how to read it right. And that's not your fault. It's, it's kind of the fault of the fact that we have a hard time reading the Bible anyway, much less reading this really cryptic book that stands at the end. And so I think that eventually down the road we probably need a good lesson on Revelation. I've taught it about three or four times over the course of the ministry, and I think you'd really benefit from it. Many of us who read Revelation may read it like we read the Gospels, but we really can't do that. It's not quite history. And some of us read it like we read the Epistles, and we really can't do that, even though this is a letter to seven churches. We, we still can't read it like an Epistle. In fact, if you think about it, and uh, if we were to have a class on this, we would read it from the point of view of Greek drama. The theater and the literature, the poetry and the drama that was being crafted in that day really informs 
how we should read the book of Revelation because it includes things like satire and irony and metaphor and different ways of reading it. And if you read it in that respect, it's really not as scary as you might think. In fact, it's a book of consolation and more so a book of protest against the very powers that were persecuting the church at that time. Revelation was written by John as he was exiled on the island of Patmos, written by this persecuted Christian to a persecuted community who was trying to find hope in the midst of a time in which they were not sure whether or not they would be alive tomorrow. And here we have this deep, abiding vision in which Jesus visits John in that exile and says, write down these words, write what you see, encourage the church that they may see what is going on. It is as if God came to John and undid this large zipper in reality and allowed him to catch the spiritual backdrop to what is happening in our world, not only today and not only yesterday, but also what is going to happen in days to come. And I think that's part of the confusion. When we read Revelation, we are confronted with all of these clashing ideas, things that are going on now, things that have gone on, and things that will go on, but also this idea of two worlds colliding together, heaven and earth, in the coming of God, in the lifting up of the judge Jesus, and in the creation of a new heaven and a new earth for days that are going to come. So yeah, that's a little confusing, but if you can see it from the point of view from a persecuted church, as a vision and as these different symbols and metaphor work to act as a different way of helping Christians to see the world differently, it has something to teach us. And I would argue something to teach us about not only what it means to be saints in communion with one another, but also teach us how to live victorious from a heaven point of view. One of the things that it teaches us about the saints is that the saints are all inclusive. All of us who call Christ Lord are called to be saints. Many of us think that saints are those who might be passed on, or more so specifically these people who have been deified by the church or lifted up, and we find when we read the Bible that all of us are saints. It was Paul writing to the Ephesians when he wrote in the first verse of the first chapter that we who are believers are saints, holy ones. To the Corinthian church, Paul wrote, to the church of God, those who are called to be saints. And we note from the Bible that saints are the people of God, another way of saying holy ones, because the, uh, the, the Greek word for saint literally means holy one, or called out ones, those who are called out from the world in order to live as holy people for a holy God. So we find throughout the scripture that we are all saints. Now you may say, well, I'm not a saint, I'm not perfect. Well, trust me, friend, if you're looking for a, a church filled with perfect people, you're barking up the wrong tree at First Baptist Church. We know that there is only one perfect person to have walked this earth, but through his righteousness, we are called out from among the world, called out from the entanglement of sin in order to live holy as God is holy. But we also learn specifically in Revelation that the saints who have gone before us are drawn up in communion with God. Now, many have come to believe that there is some kind of waiting room. You might have heard it in Catholic theology as purgatory, as if we go to some waiting room and, and you have to read up on our car and driver magazine or health <laughs> magazine while we're waiting for God to call our number. But if you read the Bible, that's not what it says. Rather, Paul admonishes us that absent with the body means that we are with the Lord. And Revelation gives us a little insight to what it means to be with God before that time of judgment. In Revelation chapter 6, John receives a vision of these seven seals, but the fifth seal specifically is, is about uh, John entering into the throne room and there at the altar he senses the saints, and he sees all of the saints who have passed on, who have gone before him, lift, allow, and 
in the communion with God, allowing their prayers to come before God. The picture is a throne room in which the prayers of the saints are being lifted before God, almost like incense. And that prayer before God is a, a very a meaningful prayer in which the people are saying, How long, O oh God? How long will it be before you come back to earth and avenge our death? How long will it be before you return and you give death that final blow? In the particular scripture verse there, one of the, the angels tells the saints a little while longer, just wait a little while longer. But then as you move past the seven seals and you move into the seventh chapter in our first lesson, we find that the saints are given white robes washed in the blood of the Lamb. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't think blood makes a very good cleaner. It is not bleach. So here we are confronted with one of these conflicting ideas that we only get in Revelation, where there are two things that just don't make sense. That the robes are made white by the blood of the Lamb. Cognitively it doesn't make sense, but we know that the blood of the Lamb is Jesus' blood shed for us, which purifies us from all sin. And what we find here is that there is going to be a day where the saints are given white robes to represent that as they come before Jesus, <coughs> that they, or they come before God, that they have been made clean by the very sacrifice of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. But then you have to move to the end of Revelation where all of the saints, the living and the dead, are, uh, those who are dead are, are raised in, imperish in, in perishable bodies, and they come before the very judgment seat of Christ, where there sits a book called the Book of Life, the Book of the Lamb, in whose names of those who are saved are written in it. And everyone, according to Scripture, will be judged. Your name is either in it or it's not in it. And those whose names are not written in that book go along with Satan and all of the demons. Death and Hades itself are cast into the burning lake of fire, whereas those who are written in the book, of the, the book of the Lamb are ushered into a new heaven and a new earth that comes about in that 21st chapter of Revelation in order to live with God forever in bodies made imperishable, eternally living for God. A lot of people think that heaven is going to be a place where we live on the clouds for the rest of our life. But Revelation gives us a very different picture of living in a new heaven and a new earth in which God resides with his people, where every tear is dried up, where death is no more, where we are able to live eternally. So yes, we acknowledge that when we die, according to the Bible, absent in the body means present with the Lord, and we find that the saints are in, brought in communion with God, but it is at that final day of victory when God descends upon earth and wipes out Satan and brings about a new heaven and a new earth before the very judgment seat of Christ that we receive in perishable bodies the resurrection in order to live eternally for God. But that has to give us pause. Now before we move in, let me ask you, is there, a, is there a, uh, some feedback here, by the way? Mm -hmm. No feedback. All right, it's just up here. I was going to say, uh, we got a little feedback. We're good. Okay, thanks. Good. Sorry. That happened one time, and I preached a whole sermon, and Christina said, you should have said something, because people are doing this during the sermon. So I figured I'd get it out of the way. <laughs> one of the things about acknowledging that we are caught up in what the Apostles' Creed calls the communion of saints is to know with that kind of hope, with that kind of future, that we live, that we are called to live victoriously every day. That because of our hope and because of the victory of knowing that death does not have the final say, that we are to not only live victoriously, but we are called to live according to the Spirit, knowing that what we see around us, the fragility of our bodies, the age that haunts us, the grief that strikes us in the midst of night, does not have the final say. That as spirit-led people who live according to the spirit rather than the flesh, we are able to live victoriously and are able to share a gospel that not only brings meaning to people's lives, but allows them to have the opportunity to join this company of saints. That we may make things right 
that the very message of the gospel that Jesus inaugurated in, his, in, in him coming to earth can continue to unfold in our life. So that's one of the things about Jesus is, in the Bible, is when you read about these passages, especially in Revelation, there's always a downward movement. Starting from Revelation 1 all the way to Revelation 2, there's this descent of heaven and God down to earth. In order to create a new heaven and an earth, a coming together of heaven and earth, until finally we get to this time of resurrection. And what we find here is that in the life of Jesus, when Jesus was born on earth, heaven started to that process of breaking in on earth. That's why Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of God. When he ministered on earth, and that's why he had the power to exercise demons and to bring healing and to bring transformation is because through Jesus Christ, heaven started to break out among us and started to break out among the church. So not only do we live lives victoriously, not only do we live spirit-led lives, but we also live lives in which we get to taste a bit of that heaven in all of us. Breaking through in the presence of the risen Savior who continues to bring healing and restoration and to bring wholeness and salvation where we are. So not only does Revelation teach us about how to be saints and about eternal life, but it also teaches us how to live. How to be people of hope who live victoriously, who live according to the Spirit because we know that the risen Christ continues to break out in our midst in order to enrapture all of us and embrace all of us in that hope. And I think the final thing that Revelation can teach us is that it teaches us how to be a people of consolation and encouragement. To endure with the saints. To mourn with those who mourn and to cry with those who cry and to laugh with those who laugh and to walk with those who walk. Because just as Revelation acted as a letter of consolation for those seven churches that were struggling in Asia Minor, so too are we called to be a church who live victoriously in order to endure together, that we may be a source of consolation and encouragement for others. Is there someone in your life that you know that doesn't have hope for tomorrow? Express to them the good news of what it means to have that opportunity to live the eternal life that allows them to transcend that hardship? Do you know someone who's struggling in their body, whose body just won't work the way they want it to? Give them the assurance that that body is only temporary, just a vessel. But it's the spirit within the vessel that lives eternally with God. Do you know someone who can't see their way out of their addictions or out of the hardships which they face? Let them know that the addiction is only something that is in the flesh, but through our spirit, through the, by living through the spirit, by living through the person of the risen Christ, we can be victorious over those things that continue to entangle us. So it's from the perspective of revelation. It's from our lesson today that we are given that hope the fact that we all are called to live this eternal life with Jesus. So I guess the only question that remains for us today are several that are real simple questions. One, will your name be written in the book of life? Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus and call him Christ and Lord that you will be counted among the family of faith in eternal life? When the role is called up yonder, will you be there? I hope so. And my prayer is that you will live life victoriously. For you know that Jesus is on our side.